Chapter 4-4, Aquatic Ecosystems Nearly three-fourths of Earth's surface is covered with water, so it is not surprising that many organisms make their homes in aquatic habitats. Oceans, streams, lakes, and marshes indeed, nearly any body of water contain a wide variety of communities. These aquatic communities are governed by biotic and abiotic factors including light, nutrient availability, and oxygen. Aquatic ecosystems are determined primarily by the depth, flow, temperature, and chemistry of the overlying water. In contrast to land biomes, which are grouped geographically, aquatic ecosystems are often grouped according to the abiotic factors that affect them. One such factor is the depth of water, or distance from shore. The depth of water, in turn, determines the amount of light that organisms receive. Water chemistry refers primarily to the amount of dissolved chemicals, especially salts, nutrients, and oxygen, on which life depends. For example, communities of organisms found in shallow water close to shore can be very different from the communities that occur from shore in deep water. One abiotic factor that is important both to biomes and aquatic ecosystems is latitude. Aquatic ecosystems in polar, temperate, and tropical oceans all have distinctive characteristics. Freshwater ecosystems. It may surprise you to know that only 3% of the surface water on Earth is freshwater. Freshwater ecosystems can be divided into two main types, flowing water ecosystem and standing water ecosystems. Flowing water ecosystems. Rivers, streams, creeks, and brooks are all freshwater ecosystems that flow over the land. Organisms that live there are very well adapted to the rate of flow. Some insect larvae have hooks that allow them to take hold of aquatic plants. Certain catfish have suckers that anchor them to rocks. Trout and many other fishes have streamlined bodies that help them move with or against the current. Flowing water ecosystems like rivers originate in mountains or hills, often springing from an underground water source. Near the source, the turbulent water has plenty of dissolved oxygen but little plant life. As the water flows downhill, sediments build up and enable plants to establish themselves. Farther downstream, the water may meander more slowly through flat areas where turtles, beavers, or river otters make their homes. Standing water ecosystems. Lakes and ponds are the most common standing water ecosystem. In addition to the net flow of water in and out of these systems, there is usually water circulating within them. This circulation helps to distribute heat, oxygen, and nutrients throughout the ecosystem. The relatively still waters of lakes and ponds provide habitats for many organisms such as plankton that would be quickly washed away in flowing water. Plankton is a general term for the tiny free-flowing organisms that live in both freshwater and saltwater environments. Unicellular algae, or phytoplankton, are supported by nutrients in the water and form the base of many aquatic food webs. Planktonic animals, or zooplankton, feed on the phytoplankton. Freshwater wetlands. A wetland is an ecosystem in which water either covers the soil or is present at or near the surface of the soil for at least part of the year. The water in wetlands may be flowing or standing in fresh, salty, or brackish, which is a mixture of fresh and salt water. Many wetlands are very productive ecosystems that serve as breeding grounds for insects, fishes, and other aquatic animals, amphibians, and migratory birds. The three main types of freshwater wetlands are bogs, marshes, and swamps. Bogs, which are wetlands that are often dominated by sphagnum moss, typically form in depressions where water collects. The water in sphagnum bogs is often very acidic. Marshes are swallow wetlands along rivers. They may be underwater for all or part of the year. Marshes often contain cattail rushes, cattails, rushes, and other tall grass-like plants. Water flows slowly through swamps, which often look like flooded forests. The presence of trees and shrubs is what distinguishes a swamp from a marsh. Some wetlands, such as swamps, are wet year-round. Other kinds of wetlands, however, may not be covered in standing water. Such areas may be classified as wetlands because they have certain types of soil and are wet enough to support a specific community of water-loving plants and animals. Estuaries Estuaries are wetlands formed where rivers meet the sea. Estuaries thus contain a mixture of fresh water and salt water and are affected by the rise and fall of ocean tides. Many are shallow, so sufficient sunlight reaches the bottom to power photosynthesis. Primary producers include plants, algae, and both photosynthetic and chemosynthetic bacteria. 
Estuary food webs differ from one of, from those of more familiar ecosystems because most primary production is not consumed by herbivores. Instead, much of that organic material enters the food web as detritus. Detritus is made up of tiny pieces of organic matter that provide food for organisms at the base of the estuary's food web. Organisms that feed on detritus include clams, worms, and sponges. Estuaries support an outstanding amount of biomass, although they usually contain fewer species than freshwater or marine ecosystems. Estuaries serve as spawning and nursery grounds for commercially important fishes and for shellfish such as shrimp and crabs. Many young animals feed and grow in estuaries, then head out to sea to mature and then re return to reproduce. Many waterfowl use estuaries for nesting, feeding, and resting during migrations. Salt marshes are temperate zone estuaries dominated by salt-tolerant grasses above the low tide line and by sea grasses underwater. Salt marshes are or once found along great sketches of eastern North America from southern Maine to Georgia. One of the largest systems of connected salt marshes in America surround the Chesapeake Bay estuary in Maryland. Mangrove swamps are coastal wetlands that are widespread across tropical regions, including southern Florida and Hawaii. Here, the dominant plants are several species of salt-tolerant trees, collectively called mangroves. Seagrasses are also common below the low tide line. Like salt marshes, mangrove swamps are valuable nurseries for fish and shellfish. The largest mangrove area in the continental United States is within Florida's Everglades, National Park. Marine Ecosystems Unless you are an avid diver or snorkeler, it takes some imagination to picture what life is like in the vast three-dimensional ocean. Sunlight penetrates only a relatively short distance through the surface of the water. Photosynthesis is limited to this well-lit upper layer known as the photic zone. Only in this relatively thin surface layer, typically down to a depth about 200 meters, can algae and other producers grow. Below the photic zone is the aphotic zone, which is permanently dark. Chemosynthetic autotrophs are the only producers that can survive in the aphotic zone. There are several different classification systems that scientists use to describe marine ecosystems. In addition to the division between the photic and aphotic zones, marine biologists divide the ocean into zones based on the depth and distance from shore. The intertidal zone, the coastal ocean, and the open ocean. Each of the zones supports distinct ecological communities. The benthic zone covers the ocean floor and is, therefore, not exclusive to any of the other marine zones. Intertidal zone. Organisms that live in the intertidal zone are exposed to regular and extreme changes in their surroundings. Once or twice a day, they are submerged in seawater. The remainder of the time, they are exposed to air, sunlight, and temperature changes. Often, organisms in this zone are battered by waves and sometimes by strong currents. There are many different types of intertidal communities. One of the most interesting is the rocky intertidal, which exists in temperate regions where exposed rocks line the shore. There are barnacles and seaweed permanently attach themselves to the rocks. Other organisms such as snails, sea urchins, and sea stars cling to rocks by their feet or suckers. Competition among organisms in the rocky intertidal zone often lead to zonation. Zonation is a prominent horizontal banding of organisms that live in a particular habitat. In the rocky intertidal zone, each band can be distinguished by differences in color or shape of the major organisms. For example, a band of black algae might grow at the highest high tide line, followed by encrusting barnacles. Lower down, clusters of blue mussels might stick out amid clumps of green algae. This zonation is similar to the pattern that you might observe as you climb up mountain. In the intertidal zone, however, zonation exists on a smaller vertical scale, just a few meters compared to the kilometers you would ascend on a mountain.